The office of reason is simply to extract conclusions from premises. Must my premises always be based upon the evidence of my senses? Must they always dictate what is rational to me? Well, having done this, I'm proven it to be a fact. Reason doesn't mean to me what it means to the world. For they would sleep in the army, and I wrote a friend of mine who was a Freudian, and he practiced psychiatry in New York City. He was drafted, he was an Englishman too, and he was drafted and he was off in Florida, a man my age. And so when I got out, knowing exactly what I did, I wrote him a detailed letter telling him what I did and how to do it. No, he was a Freudian. And that was something that didn't make sense to him. To him, the whole thing was centered in sex, not in this use of the imagination at all I. He didn't answer my letter. I got out in 1943, in the spring, in the month of April. March or April of 1943. They drafted me November the 19th, 1942, and I got out in March 1943. When the war was over and all the other fellows were being discharged, he was discharged. And he said to me afterwards, you know, Neville, I love to come to your lecture and to hear you because it's interesting, it's fairly. You turn my daily bread into the substance of fairy. But while I listen to you, you know what I do? I put my feet right down into the carpet. And I hold on to the sides of the chair to keep my sense of the reality and the profundity of things. For he kept on holding his little cot in the office for another three years because he couldn't let go and put himself where he wanted to be. So I am telling you how it's done. I am telling you how it's done from my own experience. That my perceptions are not necessarily bounded by organs of perception. I perceive more than saints, no matter how acute they are, could discover. My senses couldn't discover what I am seeing. Only in my imagination could it be done. I'm seeing the holly apartment. I am seeing Sixth Avenue. I am seeing Union Square. I am seeing the base, my wife, my child. I hadn't seen them in three months, but they're all there. I didn't bring sex into it. No, I didn't go to bed with her. There she was, the girl I loved. She wasn't her own maid, and I am my own maid. We have two beds. And my little girl was then, just over a year, not quite a year, she was born in June, of 1942, and this was not yet June of 1943, so she was not yet a year old. Here's my sweet little child, Vicky, in her bed. And I walked through the entire thing and touched all the objects and felt them so normal and so natural. Came back to my bed and slept in it. If anyone were sensitive in that room, they would have seen me sleeping there. I was so natural to myself that had seen me actually keep there. And then, the next day, he had a change of mind, but he couldn't act upon it. He was resisting that change. But that which I have done, I have done, do nothing. So he resisted it for nine days, and then he called me in. And told me to bring a new application, which I did. And that day, I was out. So I tell you how it works. This is the most practical law in the world. He looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. Well, does that liberate you? If you look into the law of liberty, then what are you now? The man, the woman you really want to be? Well, then you're in prison, though you're not behind bars. You are in prison by your present concept. You're not behind bars, you're going to go home tonight and sleep as the woman, as the man you really don't want to be. So you are in prison. Now look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere. Do not only be a hearer of what to do, do it. 
and you will be blessed in the doing. That's what scripture teaches. Go home and read it. I am not misquoting. I am quoting accurately from the epistle of James in the New Testament. And this is the story that I'm trying to tell everyone in the world. He said, I am not in prison. No, you're not in prison. Not physically. But you are in prison. You may today need money. And just, I'm still not like the fellows who are behind in the uh, same thing. All right, you're not behind jail doors, but you are still behind. Behind in rate, behind in this, and the dunning note from all the places where you charge, you are behind bars. You can't seem to find the necessary sum to pay them. All right, look into the perfect law of liberty. That's the perfect law. Well, how do I do it? Rearrange the structure of your mind. The demagnetized piece of steel does not differ in substance from the magnetized, only the arrangement of its molecules. And then one lifts up enormous weight when it's completely one-pointed. And all these molecules face one direction, it's a powerhouse. The other is cannon. So let not the double-minded man think that he will in any way receive from the Lord, you are told. The same for a chapter. If the double-minded man comes, who is unstable in all his ways, that he not think he will receive anything from the Lord. What can you give a man who doesn't know what he wants? I've gone into a restaurant just to prove this principle. Sat down, said to the waiter, what would you like for a tip? And he's embarrassed. I said to my friend, I'll give him what he wants. Well, in reason, I'm not going to give him any hundred dollar bills. But I'll give him, if he said to me, a five dollar bill. He didn't order that which warranted a five dollar bill. And he was embarrassed and embarrassed and embarrassed. And all he expected was exactly what he got. He just didn't know. He just had no concept of putting something, of course he didn't know it, so how could he put it to the test? So I am telling you, you rearrange the structure of your mind. That's all you do. It doesn't differ from Einstein's mind. There's only one mind. There's only one God. There's only one Lord. Listen to it. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, through all, and in all. If he's in you, that's the same one with the one body, the one spirit. So, I'm not using a different mind, it's the same mind, but differently arranged. Go into one room and you see that someone doesn't know what to do with their furniture. Bring someone in who knows how to set a room. Come back an hour later, after she's through with it, and you will think you're in an entirely different home. My wife used to pull that on me all the time. I come home and think I've stopped into the I've just stepped into the entirely strange apartment. I wonder if I'm really at home. And she was hiding some other place. She had completely rearranged the structure of the furniture. It looked like an entirely different home. But she had that sense how to do it. And so she did it. So with what you have, all you need is exactly what you have, for you have the mind of God. It's not a different mind, the same mind. And you simply rearrange the mind by a mere assumption. What would the feeling be like were it true? That I am now the man that I want to be. Now the woman that I want to be. But you're, it's added, but persevere. You must persevere in it. If I call you now and you answer, one thing. Well, will you respond an hour later to the same call? Then if you persevere, you will. If now... An hour later, you think of yourself as you now, when you dare to assume that you are now the man that you want to be. An hour later, are you still assuming that state? If you're not, you're not persevering. You are the hearer who looked into the mirror with his natural face and saw it. Then he went his way and at once forgot what he looked like. So if one hour from now you're not still assuming that you are the man that you want to be, you've forgotten you are the hearer and not the doer. And he warns us of the vast difference between being a hearer and being a doer. The doer acts. God only acts 
and is in existing beings only. So bear in mind that your wonderful world is not bounded by your senses. You perceive far, far more than your sense, no matter how obscure it is, could discover. Your senses can't discover, but now you're capable of assuming that you are. Your senses dictate what reason will allow, and your reason, your senses are bound together. Go beyond it for what you now know from experience. What you know from the past will not be what you will know when you know more than you now know. But having done it and proven it, I know more than I did when I was bounded by my senses. When I couldn't get out of a certain island on time to meet a commitment in Milwaukee, I knew what I did in the office. I simply applied the identical thing, and I got out. Well, it was a long, long waiting list, thousands waiting for all the islands, and only two little ships, not big ships, two small little ships, one carrying up more than 60 odd passengers. And one carrying at 120 and thousands waiting, and they only came once a month into the island. One every 32 days, and one every uh, three and a half weeks. How long would it take to get them all out? I didn't ask anyone a favor. Didn't ask my brother, who was a powerful businessman in the island. He criticized me for not arranging passage back to America when I left America. But that's the place where you should have done it. That's the powerhouse of the world, New York City. That's where all these things are done. And you dare to leave New York City when you could have arranged a round trip, and you come here on a one-way ticket. Well, I didn't ask any favors of him or any favors of any any member of the family. I simply did exactly what I did in the army. And in 24 hours, I was called by the alcohol company and given my passage. Over thousands who are waiting. This is my concern: why she did it, or why someone else didn't get it in preference to mine. And my name is down at the very bottom. I wasn't at the top. I'm at the bottom of the list. It isn't my concern. I look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and I persevered. I sat in a chair in my hotel room. And there I sat in the chair and assumed I am next to the boat and climbing up the gangplank. Just before we had a deep water harbor, we had to go off the seal up maybe a half mile or a mile to see on a little tender, and then take the gangplank and go up to the ship. So I felt myself bobbing as you would on the ocean, and then moving up the gangplank. I could smell the roaring of the sea. Got up to the top. My mind wandered. I brought it back down again and did it all over again. It wandered, brought it back down again, kept on doing it over and over until finally I did it. I fell sound asleep sitting in the chair in the act of doing it. Next day, our court calls me and gives me my passage for my wife and my little girl. So I am telling you from experience, it doesn't fail. But we must not simply be hearers of the word. We must be doers of the word. For if you are a hearer and not a doer, you deceive yourself. He tells you. For we are the operant power. This law doesn't operate itself. It doesn't care if you're good, bad, or indifferent. Look around the world. Who would think that tonight someone serving life sentence in our jail is the same mind that sits in the White House? Who would think the one who sits now in the Vatican, that mind of the Pope, is the same mind of the one who is grovelling on his belly, trying to kiss his hand? So on Sunday there'll be Palm Sunday, and they'll do all these things on Palm Sunday, the Holy Palm, and then comes Friday, then comes Sunday, and all this will go on and have all the show, fabulous show. And he who is not being born on the backs of strong, strapping men does not differ from those who are his slaves buried. The same mind, but they have rearranged their mind to be slaves, and he has arranged his mind to be the father, to be proper, the great pope. Same mind. 
There is only one mind in the world. There aren't two minds. That's why I can tell you, I know that when he stands before you, he will know you as his father. And you will know him as your son. And because I know him as my son, are we not one mind? Are we not one being? When the same being who called me father will one day call you father? Are we not the same father? The same mind, the same spirit, the same body, without loss of identity. So I'm telling you tonight, try it. Try it every moment of time. You know tonight what you want to be. I don't care what you want to be. It's simply a rearrangement of the mind. And you rearrange the mind, not through any study and any uh, so effort. It's simply a mere assumption. What do I want to be? Get it clear in my mind that I will then assume that I am it. Listen to the words in the book of Joel. Let the weak man say, I am strong. Let the weak man say, I am strong. That's in the book of Joel. Jehovah God, what the word would mean, Joel. You're called upon when you are dumb to assume that you're exactly what you want to be. Not dumb, because you don't want to be that. You want to be as free as the wind. Well, assume that you are. May I tell you in a way that no one knows you'll become it. But you must persevere. And the word perseverance is true. If I don't believe it, well then one second later, I've turned back to my former state. So I ask you to leave what you are, unless you like what you are. The portions of what you are today that you like. All right, wonderful. There are other portions that you do not like. Well, you don't have to give up the, everything in your living room when you rearrange the structure of it. Certain pieces it will keep. You may change this location, but you'll keep it. The same thing is true with the structure of the mind. You keep certain things and you let other things go. Take trains in your world who are not doing well, rearrange them in your mind's eye. And they're doing well. So put that part of the structure in your mind's eye. Rearrange the entire structure. And dare to assume that it's true. And walk in that assumption. And that assumption, though at the moment is denied by reason and denied by your senses, if you persevere in it, it will harden into fact. That comes by promise. And no one's going to stop it, may I tell you. But you could go on living in a state that you do not wish in this world. But in spite of that, you will still receive the promise. Because it isn't given to the one who is rich and deny the one who is poor. But why remain poor and bat your head out morning, noon and night against the inevitable blows in this world? I hope you do not wish money for the sake of money, but if you need money, well then apply this law. What would the feeling be like if it were true that I was now free of this pressure, free of it? Dare to assume that you are, and then persist in that assumption, and that assumption will harden into reality. So this is my lesson tonight. I think you have found it a very practical one. But I must remind you, you can either be the hearer of what you've heard tonight, and not the doer. It is my hope that you will be the doer of what you've heard tonight. So that when you leave here, you leave here in the assumption, not wait until you get home. Leave here in the assumption that you are already the man, the woman that you want to be. And then, between here and home, think of the man that you have assumed that you are, and let that, that assumption spring in your mind constantly. You are that man. Go to bed in that assumption. Maybe this night, as it did with me in the army, something will come, and a voice will speak, and when vision breaks forth into speech, the presence of deity is assured. And maybe you will have confirmation that what you have dared to assume is I know in my case it came that way. But it will come whether it breaks forth into speech or not, if you persist in the assumption. Now let us go into the silence.